Okay, let's get into topic 1C.7. It's the final topic of domain one, but it may be one of the most important things you're gonna work with, especially in terms of getting ready for your AP exam. Uh, we're gonna be working with what's called the Intermediate Value Theorem. You can see already it's abbreviated as IVT, and that's a fair abbreviation. Anytime you wanna cite this theorem, you can abbreviate it as IVT. Unlike the Squeeze Theorem, whenever we use the Intermediate Value Theorem, you do have to cite it by its name, but you can abbreviate it IVT. And we'll actually look more uh, at that in the part two video. But I want you to kind of visualize what's happening here. So let's consider a continuous function f of x. And we know some points here. We know that f of negative two is three. We know that f of zero is negative one. And we know that f of two is equal to one. We don't know anything else about the function, no other points. We just know that it's continuous and we know these three points. The question is, how many x-intercepts must this function have on the closed interval negative 2 to 2? And if you look at it, the key word here is continuous. So let's actually make that our first note here. f of x must be continuous in order for this to work. If f of x was not continuous, I could make all kinds of jumps and never actually cross the x-axis. But you can see here visually, because it has to be a continuous function, I'm gonna have to cross the x-axis at least once right here. And then when I go back up here towards the function value of one, I'm gonna have to cross the x-axis at least a second time. So f of x must have at least two x-intercepts. There is no way for me to draw a continuous function from three to negative one to one without crossing the x-axis at least twice. The other thing is f of x may have more than two x-intercepts. And that's actually what I'm gonna draw here in the actual graph space is I know I have to cross the x-axis at least twice, but I could draw a function here where it crosses it once, twice, three times to come down to here, and then I could cross it a fourth time and maybe just touch the x-axis for a fifth time. That fits, it's a continuous function, and that one has five different x-intercepts. So it has to have at least two, but it could have more than two, and that would be an acceptable graph of f of x as it would be described here. But it had to cross, if I went from here to here to here, and I'm continuous, it has to cross the x-axis at least twice. And that's really the visual of what we're about to say here with the intermediate value theorem. So if f is a continuous function, and that's important here, on the closed interval a to b, so that's along the x-axis here, and d is some number in between f of a and f of b, then the intermediate value theorem guarantees that there's at least one value c on the interval a and b where f of c is equal to d. And we're going to kind of graph this so you can get a little bit of a visual for what's happening here. But it's actually a very common sense theorem that we're explaining in the uh, graph above. We're going to want to invoke the intermediate value theorem. And one of the things we're going to talk about in class is how to actually cite theorems you wanna take a look at what's after the if. You need to be able to state all of the material after f. So we need to be able to say that f is continuous on a to b right there. We may have to infer that from some information later on in domain two, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So we have to say f is continuous. We then also have to show that d is a number between f of a and f of b. And it's going to look like this kind of an inequality. Either D is going to be in between F of A and F of B reading that way, or the inequality could read the other way. If we meet those two criteria in the if part, the hypothesis of this statement, then we get to make the conclusion. We'll be able to claim that there is at least one value C on the interval A to B such that F of C is equal to D. And like I said at the start of the video, whenever we reference this, we do have to specifically reference the IVT, the intermediate value theorem. It's gonna be the first of three value theorems in this calculus course. They guarantee the existence of a value, not necessarily how many values there are. They just guarantee the existence of it. And it relies, as I've said, heavily on the continuity of the function because any break in continuity removes 
the guarantee that the value exists. So let's try to graph more of the arbitrary case that's happening here. So we're going to have a continuous function on the interval a to b along the x-axis. So we're going to have some sort of interval a to b right there. Then we're going to have function values. It really doesn't matter the order in which I place these in, but I'm going to go ahead and let that be f of a, and I'll let this value right here be f of b. And that means that I'm going to need to draw some points here. So here's a f of a, here's b f of b. So if I have a continuous function between these two points, and as long as the value d is in between f of a and f of b, so let's say that I have some sort of value here that I'm going to call d. And I'll kind of draw this horizontal line for you to kind of see the visual here. Basically what we're saying is there's no way to go from this point to this point while being continuous without crossing over d. And so if I draw this right here, it's kind of what the function maybe looks like. So let's say this is f of x because it has to be a continuous function. Then there is some value right here, c, on the interval a to b where f of c is equal to d. The reason why it relies on the continuity of the function. If I draw a non-continuous function, I can actually skirt around that value d. So let's do our closed interval from a to b, same idea. We have a function value at a, we have a function value at b, and so those are points. We have a f of a and b f of b right there. Well, if I have some value d, and again, I have a horizontal line here just to kind of let you see what's happening here. I can, if I have a break in continuity, I don't have to actually cross over that value d. I can simply come up here and maybe I can put an open point and then have a jump discontinuity. So I don't actually guarantee that the function crosses through that value d. That's why continuity is going to be so important with what we're working with. So remember, we have to state it's continuous. We have to show that d is in between two function values on a to b. And then we can go ahead and make the claim here. So what we're going to focus on here in this part one is just to see if we can actually use the intermediate value theorem. Part two will show some more of the actual applications and uses of it, like what you would see in an AP exam. But the intermediate value theorem requires the function to be continuous. And this is going to rely heavily on what we learned early in 1C, especially 1C.2, where we want to talk about continuity over an interval. So let's take a look at these functions and see if the IVT can be applied. And basically what we're checking for is continuity. So let's take a look at this function here, f of x. And I'm going to go ahead and factor uh, the numerator and the denominator. So the numerator is x minus 2, x minus 1. The denominator is x plus 2, x minus 2. Now the x minus 2s do cancel. So the limit as x approaches 2 of this function would exist. However, it's still undefined, the function is at 2. So because f of 2 is undefined, the function is not continuous on the interval 0 to 4. So the IVT does not apply. We would be unable to use this theorem to guarantee the existence of a value on that interval 0 to 4. All right, let's take a look at this next function. We're going to look. It's going to look very similar, uh, and we're looking on the interval 2 to 6. So let's go ahead and factor it. And the numerator is x minus 5, x minus 3. The denominator is x plus 2, x plus 4. So this function is undefined at negative 2 and at negative 4, but neither one of those values are on the interval 2 to 6. And even though you look at the numerator and you think, hey, 5 and 3, Remember, that just means the function's equal to zero. Uh, it's not undefined. So this function's well behaved except at negative two and at negative four, but those are not on the interval. So we would be able to say f of x is continuous on this closed interval two, six. And because it's continuous, the IVT applies. And again, we'll look more at the actual applications of it uh, in part two of this video. 
All right, we have f of x equals tangent of x. Let's just kind of remind ourselves uh, if we have issues trying to remember where tangents may be undefined, let's think about it as being sine of x over cosine of x. Well, it's going to be undefined wherever cosine is equal to zero. And that occurs at things like pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and both of those are outside of this interval. So very similar to what we had up here, the function is continuous. on that interval negative pi over 3 to pi over 3. And so because the function is continuous, we can say that the IVT will apply. And again, that's one of the things we're going to focus on in part 2. All right, we have this next function. It's a piecewise function, and hopefully you're getting a little bit of alarm bells going off as to where this may be headed. We're looking on the interval 0 to 2, and you can see by the piecewise function, we need to figure out what happens at 1 here. So let's go ahead and say f of 1. Well, if it equals 1, we're going to plug it into this cubic piece. So 1 cubed minus 2 times 1 plus 2 is just simply going to equal 1. Let's do the limit as x approaches 1 from below of f of x. Uh, that's going to be for values less than 1. And so this is going to be 2 minus 1, which of course is 1. And the limit as x approaches 1 from above of f of x. We'll substitute again into the cubic piece, 1 cubed minus 2 times 1 plus 2, and of course, as we showed earlier, that equals 1. So we can go ahead and say that this function is continuous at 1 by saying f of 1 equals 1, which is also the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. So f of x is continuous at x equals 1. And because I have no other issues with the way that this function is going to be defined, it's continuous at 1, it's going to be continuous uh, on the interval 0 to 2, so the IVT will apply. Again, the function has to be continuous in order to uh, use the intermediate value theorem. So we're going to look at this kind of simply maybe from a table here, uh, and then maybe get into some more challenging functions uh, in part 2 here. But if the function is continuous on the closed interval, then the IVT can be used to find the presence of specific values. And really, maybe the most common use are when we want to talk about the zeros of a function. So let's consider the continuous function. And there's your big word right there. It is a continuous function, f of x, with selected values uh, in the table below. The question is, what is the minimum number of x-intercepts f of x is guaranteed to have on the interval negative 4 to 12. So let's start off by saying that f of x is continuous. Yes, it said it in the problem, but you need to go ahead and state it here. So now let's figure out how many x-intercepts or how many zeros is it guaranteed to have. Well, if the function's at 3 and then goes to negative 1 and it's continuous, it has to cross 0. So how do we articulate that mathematically? Here's what we want to focus on. We want to say f of negative 4. The function value at negative 4 is equal to 3. Remember, what we're trying to really show is that 0 is in between these two numbers. So 3 is greater than or equal to 0, which is greater than or equal to negative 1. In other words, 0 is in between these two function values, and we know negative 1 because that's f of negative 2. The ability to write this kind of an inequality statement is going to be really important, not just for the IVT, but for other theorems that we use in this class. So the function value at negative 4, which is 3, is greater than 0, because remember, we're trying to show the zeros or the x-intercepts of this function. So 3 is greater than 0, which is greater than negative 1, which is what f of negative 2 is. All right, let's keep reading here. We go from negative 1 to negative 2. We could actually cross the x-axis here, but we can't guarantee it. Still negative, but between 3 and 6, we cross from negative to positive. So let's kind of write this same idea here. f of 3 is negative 1, and we want to show that 0 is in between negative 1 and 2. So we want to make sure our inequality reads correctly. Negative 1 is less than 0, or equal to, but it's less than, which is also less than or equal to 2 which is what f of 6 is. 
All right, so let's keep reading. So we've got two, then six, then two, and then again, between 10 and 12, we cross uh, the x-axis again. So we want to say that f of 10, which is equal to 2, is greater than or equal to 0, which is greater than or equal to negative 4, which is what f of 12 is. Notice that in all three cases, we show that 0 is in between the two function values that are given. And so we can say that on at least three occasions, there are at least three zeros guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem. Notice again that as we work these, we've stated that it's continuous and we're showing that zero, the value we're trying to show it crosses through, is in between known function values. It happens at least three times. It could happen more than three times, but we can guarantee from this table of values that the function has at least three x-intercepts, and that's guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem.